Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.ise.com slash podcasts. Synchronized business cycles. Uh, again, we just didn't have that. Now, with the globalization of the of the economy in general, we we start to see business cycles to be more and more synchronized. Um, but again, the 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 common currency really was based on really one economy um, as the driver, and it was Germany. So all the monetary policy, the one size monetary policy fits all, was always targeted to Germany. And if other economies were out of sync with Germans' need on interest rates, um, then so be it. So we never really had that. So that was another problem. And harmonized fiscal discipline. Um, again, there was an attempt, people signed treaties, but there was no real enforcement of this as, as we see now. All of a sudden, uh, people are waking to the fact um, that uh, budget deficits are, are blowing out and, and, all other, and all kinds of other hidden problems in these, uh, in these countries. Um, again, there was no mechanism to really drive that other than just, hey, sign the treaty type of thing. Um, things that they would have needed are, you know, a, a treasury, a uh, common treasury across these uh, various countries, and really c- common cross-border banking regulation. When the credit crunch hit, we saw how the incredible disunity um, among the various countries that are part of the monetary union in their own banking regulations, um, which again created more chaos and more trouble. So these things were, I think, seen by a lot of people beforehand, and we were just looking for the test, uh, and we got the test in terms of the credit crunch, which kind of brought all these warts to the surface, so to speak. And these are things that are obviously still with them, and these are things that now have become, um, that are creating more tensions, um, (laughs) and, and they have less chance, I think, of achieving these things going forward. This is a quote here from Milton Friedman, who's you know one of our favorites of all time, um, and he he said this back in 1999. He was never he never thought the euro would would hold together, and, and it was kind of a a very prescient comment. Um, he talked about you know as they add more and more countries and more and more layers of regulation, um, more and more susceptible to a to a shock in the system. Um, and he thought the internal contradictions, this whole idea of the contradictions being that the euro was an artificial construct to begin with, uh, the idea that you have one mon- monetary policy fits all, the idea that all the countries should be able to borrow at German in- low German interest rates and never made any sense because the other countries were much more risky than Germany was, all those contradictions he thought sooner or later um, the global economy hits a real bump. And that real bump... Um, didn't come really until the credit crunch of 2007-2008. Uh, that was the bump, and the euro has is start, it has really failed the test, um, and we'll see how badly it fails. <clears throat> this um, came yesterday from um, e- Ambrose Evans Pritchard, who writes for The Telegraph, and has done a pretty good job of covering this uh, whole euro mess. Um, I think he's um, done as good a job as anybody out there on a regular basis uh, of late. Um, and he talks about the big problem now is Spain, and the reason Spain is, is such is such a more dangerous creature here um, than even Greece is because of the size of Spain um, and the depth of, of core problems uh, within Spain are as bad as Greece uh, or, or worse. Um, and and he thinks that or they're in a case now where um, he just says only two things can happen: either Germany continues to tolerate this and, and continues to be the paymaster, um, and 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 hooks the German taxpayers um, to infinitum um, uh, against uh, this ideal of the European Monetary Union, or uh, one of these countries, Spain, he, which he thinks is going to be the one that may be forced out of the EMU. There's already a lot of talk of Greece leaving and their politicians talking about this. But there's turmoil in all these countries now, political turmoil across the board. Um, Merkel is tied her wagon to the euro and, and is probably, and we said this probably about six or eight months ago, we think she'll commit political suicide if she ties her wagon to the euro, and she seems to be doing that. Uh, the president of Germany uh, just quit her administration, so to speak, and it looks like he may take a run at her. And if and we're seeing political problems, obviously in Greece, a lot of the key administration in Greece has already resigned, and that government's in complete turmoil. Spain is next 
southwest in the turmoil, starting in a very big way in Spain. We're starting to see it in Italy, too. You know, all of these uh, players within uh, these countries uh, were, all, were promised by their leaders that everything's going to be hunky-dory when they get part of the, the European Monetary Union, and they've lived high on the hog because of the credit created um, by being able to borrow at German interest rates. Um, but the market sooner or later has a way of catching up, and the market is catching up, and that goes to Friedman's point of, of the real bump. So that's, those are really some of the core uh, problems, or at least, I guess, the major themes. Um, back, if you step back even from the numbers and look at it and say, this system was flawed really uh, very, you know, from day, day one, really. Um, the next point that uh, Pritchard makes in here is a catastrophic chain reaction throughout um, North Europe's banking system. Uh, I was asked um, by a friend of mine uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, what do you think of, are, are the European banks a good buy in here, uh, given how far they've fallen? Well, I said, you know, I guess it depends on your time frame. If we get a bounce in the stock market near term and, and we get some euphoria in here the next few weeks, maybe European banks bounce. Um, they did a little bit. Um, but the reality is, all of this stuff going on with Greece and all of this stuff going on at the G20 even uh, a year and a half ago was about saving the European banking system. Um, all of this stuff is the, – the exposure to the European banking system is huge. I don't think we even know it. Um, I'll give you some numbers that I think are conservative that the, Euro, that the European Central Bank came out and talked about just recently, uh, but they are conservative. Uh, the reason the European banking system <clears throat> problems um, – uh, are so important is because Europe generates a ton of money relative um, to their GDP um, from their banking and financial system compared to the U.S., for example, and other and other countries. Um, it's a huge driver, and it's a hu it's going to be a huge chain reaction because. Not only is it, is it the core countries of Europe that are exposed, if the European banking system gets into trouble, and I'll talk about this, the contagion problem from to Europe to Eastern and Central Europe becomes becomes really dire. Their funds just evaporate immediately, um, and that just creates a whole whole another set of systemic risk uh, for the global economy. But you know, I think he hit it right on the money here. This really is ultimately about the European banking system and trying to save it, and that's really why they agreed to let the IMF come in. The IMF puts U.S. taxpayers um, on the hook for a lot of this and starts to create more and more bailout money um, so the European banking system can start to unload some more of that, that bad paper that it's already starting to unload in a very, very big way on the balance sheet of the European Central Bank since the European Central Bank uh, has basically opened the floodgates and said we're going to have uh, quantitative easing, even though Trichet continues to say it's not really quantitative easing, but... Um, but in fact, uh, it, it sure is, and there's no other way to describe it. Um, let me go through this chart, because this is an important chart, and I think it really it says it all. Uh, this chart uh, shows the spread between Spanish 10-year bonds um, against the German 10-year bonds. And as I said, Germany is the core here. I mean, they're the solid player in all of this, um, and so everything is measured against them um, as the you know, fiscally secure country, so to speak, even though they have their own banking system problems. That's kind of another dirty little secret um, that isn't hitting the press. They have some real problems uh, in their own banking system um, that, you know, uh, that, doesn't, that don't look pretty, but, but they pale in comparison to the others, and that's why people are not talking about it. But anyway, Germany as the, as the Bund is the core quality benchmark is which we compare against. And this shows um, of late, you can see here, what I want, the point I wanted to make in here, the euro, introduction to the euro is right in here. And you notice the spread of uh, 4.5%, 500 basis point spread in here um, for Spanish bonds against German bonds um, before the euro introduction. Um, that's probably, that was probably more of a, a proper market pricing of of Spanish versus German bonds. German's fiscally responsible, Spain not. Um, of course, the introduction of the euro, and it creates this artificialness for a very long time, allowing Spain to borrow um, at close to German interest rates. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.